Betrayal at House on the Hill was designed by Bruce Glasgow, Rob Davio, Will McQuillan, Mike Selinker, and Theo and Woodruff as a semi-cooperative adventure game where players take on the roles of characters who found a haunted house on a hill and decided to go inside and have an adventure for some reason. An adventure that takes place over the course of two phases. During the first phase, the explorer phase, everyone's working together to explore the house, having strange encounters, finding weird and unique items that can help them, and even finding some companions that can help them out until something very special happens known as the haunt where not always but usually one player will turn against the group and then the game becomes a fight for either survival or destruction. Ever since Betrayal at House on the Hill was released in 2004, it has had a strange lifespan. Back when it first came out and even when the second edition came out, which is what I'm reviewing, people fell in love with the concept of playing through a horror movie and you were walking through this house seeing what happened to your characters and it became a fan favorite. But in recent years, a lot of people have started dragging the game down when the designers had allegedly come out and admitted that they had not tested all of the haunt scenarios before the game was released. And since that alleged admission, the game has been developing a bad reputation as an unfinished clunker. 20 years later, do I still think the second edition holds any weights? Let's find out. When it comes to the gameplay, I want to talk about it in two parts. The exploration phase by itself and then the haunt by itself because they're very different from each other but each of them takes up around half of the gameplay. When it comes to the Explorer gameplay, I found it very entertaining despite some flaws. There is some flaws with it that I found, the biggest one by far being that there is a lot of luck because the vast majority of stuff that you do in the Explore phase and even in the Haunt phase, which I'll talk about later, is resolved by rolling dice. When you want to perform a check of any kind, whether it's crossing the chasm or opening the vault or flinging off a spider or, or even fighting a potential enemy, it's all done by rolling dice. And apart from some items that allow you to add more dice to your roll, there really is not a whole lot of mitigation that you can do to affect the results. So if you just have bad luck with the dice repeatedly, you could end up in a situation where you're just getting beaten up the entire explorer phase, and then by the time the haunt actually starts, you're actually weaker there than when you were at the start of the game. On a positive note, the game does try to compensate for you potentially getting beat up in two ways. The first one being that there is a room for each of the four stats that the characters will have, and it allows you to increase each of those stats by one if you end your turn there. Now, you can only do that once per game for each room, so it's not much of a mitigation, but it is better than just having a whole bunch of rooms that potentially just smack you around for the entire phase. The other is that there is an abundant amount of items and even some omens that can grant increases to your stats if you can manage to find them. So while you can get beaten up a lot, there is some attempt to compensate and mitigate the amount of damage that you take to yourself and even give you a chance to rebuild yourself to an extent if you do get unlucky with the dice. Not to mention the fact that in the explorer phase, nobody can actually die, which is great because that way you're not worried that you're gonna get eliminated three turns in and then just have to sit there and watch for like an hour or so. With all that said, there is quite a bit that I absolutely love about the Explore phase. For starters, it has one of the coolest ways of starting a game that I have ever seen in my life. Each character has a birthday, and whosever birthday is closest to the day that you're playing the game without actually having already happened goes first. It is such a creative system, and I am so glad they actually took the time to create something outside of 
roll a die. Whoever rolls highest goes first, or the youngest player goes first, or the oldest goes first, or just choose the start player by any means you can think of. They actually took the time to create something unique. And I know it's a small thing. It doesn't add a whole lot to the actual gameplay itself, but it is really nice to see a fresh take on choosing a start player. I also really love the exploration itself. I love the idea of moving around this house, wanting to find out something new, wanting to discover new stuff, but you're always a little bit nervous because you don't know what's gonna happen to you once you open that door. And as much as I ragged on how much luck there is in terms of the die roll, and really as well in terms of the draw of the cards and the tiles, because you don't know what's gonna happen to you when you draw a tile or a card, just as much as you don't know what's going to happen when you roll the dice, but I do love the fact that there are various encounters that can happen to you and affect your stats of impacting your character, even if it may not be the most cohesive style of storytelling that there could be. Like, at one point, you walk into the statuary corridor, and then all of a sudden, you find three hanging men! Why are there three hanging men there? And then another player or even the same player in the future could walk onto the tower and then see the ghost of a groundskeeper who sees you and then suddenly charges at you with a shovel for some reason. So the encounters that happen in this game, while maybe not being the most cohesive, it is a lot of fun to me to explore the house and see what you find. To add to that, I love the fact that there are some rooms and lots of event cards that can provide optional actions for the players to perform at some point during their journey through the house. Like, at one point, you can enter the underground lake and then find that there's a skeleton down there. And if you want, you can test your sanity to search that skeleton. Or if you want, you can attempt a knowledge roll in order to try to find your way through the catacombs. Or if you want to try to open the closet in the crypt then you need to attempt a might roll just little extra possibilities added on to what the players can do and it almost adds a little bit of a role-playing element to the game i also really like the ability to find items throughout the house and even some companions that can join us on our journey as we go through this adventure and as we go through it combined with finding items, finding companions, and encounters with the events, it almost feels like for the first half of the game, we're actually building up and developing our characters for the game's conflict, that being the haunt. And speaking of the haunt, I absolutely love the system that they came up with to determine if the haunt starts or not. Every time you draw an omen card, you roll six dice. If that is equal to or higher than the number of omens that have already been discovered, you can keep exploring. If not, the haunt begins. And the reason why I love that is because every single haunt rule that is done has the potential to produce some tension as you could sit there thinking, is this going to be the one where the haunt begins? Please don't let this be the one. Even in the first couple haunt rolls, you can still produce some tension, even if it may seem unlikely. In fact, the last game I played of this, we drew the first omen card, and when we rolled the first haunt roll, we were making jokes about how unlikely this was going to be, and yet we rolled the six dice, and we rolled a one. We were this close to starting the haunt on the first omen card. And when we rolled those dice for the first haunt roll and rolled a one, that sent a feeling of shock through all all of us because we had almost witnessed the haunt begin. So in terms of the gameplay for the exploration phase itself, there are some big flaws in regards to the fact that there is a lot of luck in die rolling, card drawing, and tile drawing, but it's not enough to ruin the experience of playing through the exploration phase for me. When it comes to the gameplay of the haunt phase, it's really a similar story to the explore phase except the problems that I had with the explore phase actually are a little bit amplified for the haunt phase. But before I talk about that, I want to talk about one brief thing that just bugs me. Not enough to downplay the game, but it's a real nitpick that I have. Now, I don't know if as many people are bothered by this as much as me, 
but it bothers me that when you get to be the traitor and you get your haunt scenario, the objective for the traitor in the vast majority of these haunts is just kill all the heroes. And the reason why this bothers me is because when you play the game and you're a hero, every haunt, your objective as a hero is going to be different. In one game, you could have to destroy something that the trader needs. In the next game, you may have to return something to somewhere. In another game, you could have to basically perform a ritual to do something. And it's just more interesting to play the haunt face of the game as a hero because every haunt you're going to be doing something differently and that makes it a lot more interesting than playing the haunt face as a traitor where your objective most of the time is just going to be kill everybody and because of that it makes the game play for the haunt phase a lot less fun to play as the traitor because you're more likely gonna get one objective more often than not when you play i really wish they could have had 50 different objectives for the 50 different haunts for the traitor just like they did with the heroes to make it so much more interesting to play as the traitor and make you want to play as a traitor or as a hero rather than at least for me prefer to play as a hero rather than the traitor now that's just more of a nitpick that doesn't drop the gameplay value of the haunt face for me what bothers me more about the haunt play is the fact that the luck factor is even more important than in the explore face because half of the time luck determines who the trader is going to be. So if you ended up having a bad playthrough of the explorer phase and you ended up being the trader, well, you're in a bad position to try to accomplish your goal because you just had bad luck and you just kept getting beat up. And that can go the other way as well. If one player is revealed as the trader, but that player had a really good explorer phase while the other players who've become the heroes got beaten up the whole time and they're left in a weak state they're in a bad position to try to achieve their goals and that can be made even worse if the traitor and or the heroes were weak combined with the fact that the dice favor one side over the other too much one side can be easily defeated and the side who ended up winning may not actually feel like they've actually won the game because they were favored so much and they just feel like that wasn't much of a challenge. So if you're the kind of gamer who does not like the idea of luck potentially favoring one side over the other and you want a game of two sides that depends on strategy and skill to achieve victory, then this may not be the game for you. Despite all that, I do like a lot of aspects of the haunt phase as well. First of all, I love the idea of the game resuming starting with the player to the trainer's left as that actually gives all of the heroes one chance to potentially escape from something that they could end up being in danger of once the trainer starts and basically just give them a chance to respawn and get themselves a chance to put themselves into a position where they can start working on their objectives rather than just resuming turn order, especially if the trader was about to take the first turn after the haunt phase, because if it was to resume turn order and the first player to start the haunt phase was the trader, the trader could potentially kill off maybe one or two of the players in his first turn before the other players get a chance to respawn and almost basically shift all the momentum toward the trader and make it almost impossible if not incredibly hard for the heroes to win so to have the player to the left of the trader start the second phase of the game it at least gives everybody a chance to have a turn and, and to have a chance to respond i also really like the fact that when you are playing through the haunt you are still allowed to explore new rooms in the house and discover new stuff and try to find stuff that can help you instead of the house simply just locking down and making it so whatever you have discovered is basically what you've got to work with and almost turns the house into an arena that you're fighting in and related to what i was talking about earlier when i was talking down on the fact that the majority of the time if you play as the trader your objective is going to be 
kill all the heroes. When you play as the heroes, every time you play this game, you are going to have a different objective for the haunt, depending on which haunt you get. Like I said, you could have to destroy an object in one game. Next game, you may have to return something, and etc., etc. And so, I love the fact that when you play this game as the heroes in the haunt phase, you are likely to have a different objective every time you play through, and it just provides a more interesting and more memorable experiences for the heroes. One last thing I want to talk about in regards to the haunt gameplay before I get to my overall summary of the gameplay as a whole, but it is a slight spoiler, nothing too important, but if you don't want to be spoiled on anything, then I would highly recommend clicking the timestamp in the description and you'll skip ahead to where I give my final thoughts on the gameplay. So the final thing I wanted to touch on for the haunt side of the gameplay is that I really like the fact that there is going to be a few haunts where there actually is either no traitor at all or the fact that there could be a hidden traitor. Now it doesn't happen often, but I do like the fact that there are a few haunts in the game that don't have a traitor because it actually shakes up the idea and can help keeping the game from becoming predictable. Because with these few extra haunts that do not have a traitor, it actually, to me at least, can help keep the players invested in the game and wondering which scenario are we going to play rather than him just being like, well, we know somebody's going to backstab us. We just don't know who or how. So overall, in terms of the gameplay, the explorer phase, despite the fact that there are some, some issues with the amount of luck that is in it, I still found the explorer phase very entertaining. And then in terms of the haunt, I he found it not quite as entertaining because the problems with the luck factor kind of can be come even more problematic in the haunt phase but i still found entertainment there so in terms of the overall gameplay i do find some issues and i do see some people not liking the gameplay because of the luck factor that is prevalent and can be problematic for both halves of the game but I still found it entertaining. When it comes to the replay value, this game is flooding with it. There are six double-sided characters with a different set of stats on each side of the character tiles. So that even if you are playing with a full complement of six players, which is the maximum amount, you can have multiple games where you have a different arrangement of characters in the game for every time you go through the house. So that alone adds a good amount of replay value because you're unlikely to play through the game with the same set of characters. Also, every time you play through this game, the house that you're in is going to have a different layout every single time. And because of that, the items, events, and omens that you're going to encounter are always going to occur in a completely different sequence. You could play one game where almost all of one floor is discovered and not much of the other two. You could have a game where a little bit is discovered on all three floors. You could have one game where you maybe had found the vault on the upper floor and then the walls suddenly revolved and now you're suddenly in a different room. Next game, you could find the vault again, but this time it's in the basement. And when you went into the basement and found the vault, all of a sudden there's now smoke covering the entire room. That level of change that can happen from game to game adds so much replay value to this experience. And of course, I cannot talk about the replay value without mentioning the fact that every time you play this game, you will play one of 50 different encounters from these two books. Each of these scenarios has their own story with their own antagonist and especially if you play as the heroes, you will have a different way to win each game. So in terms of the replay value, this game is just flooding with it. In terms of how easy the game is to teach and to play, the basic turn rules are very simple. You move up to your character's speed. If you move through a door, 
you go through the deck, you find the first tile that matches the floor that you're on, you flip that over, and you attach the room to the house, door to door as best as you can. If it has multiple doors, leave one open so that you can keep exploring, and if there's any symbols on that tile, your movement immediately ends, you draw the appropriate card, and if there's any instructions on that card, then you do what the card says. The main rule book I thought was done very well. All of the actions that you could perform during the explore phase I thought were explained very clearly. I never had any questions of how to do this. His, how do I connect the house with this new room? When can I perform this is optional action? All that was explained pretty nicely. I also enjoyed the fact that they actually have a special section here for all the various special rooms that you can encounter in the game and explain how all of them worked. In terms of the rules for the haunt, selecting the haunt was very simple. You go to the first page of the Trader's Tome, find the last Omen card that was drawn, and the current room that the haunt had begun in. You cross those two on the chart, and whatever number is showing, that's the haunt you're playing. You then find that number down on the bottom here, and that explains who the trader is. When it comes to the haunt rules, the basic rules for the haunt I thought were explained really well. The rule book I thought did a great job in explaining concepts like making an attack, making a special attack, the trader's new powers, if they have any, how monsters work, what to do if you need to move past an opponent, all that basic requirements for the haunt I thought were all explained very well. In terms of the rules for the haunts themselves, I really can't explain them because if I were to, I would be spoiling all the haunts, and I don't want to spoil anything for you in case you were interested in picking up this game, but what I can say is that in the games that I've played, they were clear enough that we've never run into a situation where we've had the rules conflict with the two sides, and we've had to basically argue over which side takes priority, and or we've ended up with a situation where we had a question about when we can do this, how who does this part work, and the rules on either book didn't explain, so we had to come up with a house rule on the fly. None of that stuff happened. So in terms of how easy this game is to play, I can't really gauge really well on how it is, but I can say is that the basic rules for the game, for the explore phase, and the basic rules for the haunt phase they are both very easy. When it comes to the game's aesthetics, for the most part, I actually thought it was great. There were just two big things that bothered me. One is the one that I've heard the most people complain about, the fact that the sliders on the characters were questionable at best for their quality, and that has not changed with the games that I've played. The games that I have had I've had sliders that either stuck to the characters too well and so I couldn't move them at all, or I've had ones where they couldn't stay in place and I've had to constantly be looking down and adjusting them, making sure that my character has the right stats because any sort of movement could knock them loose. The other thing that really bothered me were the little tokens that represented things that you could find or her ways to basically acknowledge that hey you need to make a might check here or maybe you have an item that's in a room that you need to come pick up and they just made them little tokens that had the word written on them. Now I do understand why they didn't take the time to make like a little symbol or picture for every individual token in the game because that would have taken a lot more time, increased their production costs as well, but just making generic looking tokens with the word written on them just makes the game look a lot cheaper. Apart from that, the aesthetics of the game I thought were really good. I very much liked the layout for the character tiles and how it's very clear which stat line belongs to which skill that each of the characters have. I love the fact that they added little hobbies for each of the individual characters because some of the haunts in the game actually relate to a specific character's hobby and I thought that was a very good little attention to the detail that they went for in the game aesthetically wise. I also thought they did a great job 
with the actual miniatures themselves. They're all very well painted, and I thought that they did a great job with detailing the little minis. I also thought that the cards were of pretty good quality. The text on the back showing the actual symbols for the three different types of encounters that you'll have are all very easy to see and able to be told very well from each other. I also thought that the tiles themselves were very good for the most part. The backs of the tiles, you can very easily tell what floor shows what as it actually has the text surrounded by a slight dark shadow to help the letters separate themselves from the yellow background. I also thought the text on the tiles themselves were very well done. It's very easy to read and the symbology on the tiles for the most part is easy to read and easy to see which symbol is which. There is two tiles that is slightly problematic the research laboratory and the operating laboratory because there are symbols there in the bottom right corner but because they were surrounded by a yellow background the event symbol almost blends into the tile so i do think in terms of those two tiles it would have benefited had they chosen to maybe have the symbol surrounded by a slight black shadow kind of like what they did for the backs of the tiles but that's only in regards to those two tiles all the other tiles i didn't really have any problems with seeing the symbols so in terms of aesthetics despite a couple minor things that i would have changed i thought that the aesthetics were really good when it comes to the theme of a group of friends walking through a house exploring the house having an adventure until one of them betrays the group i actually found the theme to be really strong the tiles in the game as well as the flavor text on the event cards actually to me gave a help give out a really good creepy atmosphere as well as the introduction in scenario or the introduction flavor text to the various haunt scenarios when you read them out they're all creepy and they help also enhance the atmosphere of the game and it also can help develop that feeling of dread and uncertainty of what did we just get into and despite the fact that the mechanisms of the game are really simple you're just really moving around the house and discovering new rooms and occasionally throwing some dice but to me it really felt like i was exploring this house and i really felt like i was involved here and i was taking part in an interactive horror movie with the three act structure the first act we're all just exploring this house discovering new things and having things happen to us second act the haunt is revealed the traitor is revealed and we get introduced to the story's conflict which is this is the scenario that we got and then the third act is us basically fighting it out and try to accomplish our goal while the trainer tries to accomplish its goal and it just really does to me fit a three act structure or like we are playing through a horror movie so in terms of the theme to me i actually thought that it was very thematic overall i do not think that this is the best horror themed game ever but i do think it is an entertaining game the gameplay is fine it's entertaining but it's not amazing because of the amount of luck that's involved with it. The replay value, however, is amazing. You've got so many opportunities to play through differently with each, each scenario that you have and how much extra stuff that is in the game. The easing of play and how easy the game is, the basic rules for the game is fine, but it can be complicated on once you get to the haunt side of it the aesthetics apart from a couple small things i thought were great and the theme is definitely there i can definitely see this as a game that if you are somebody who wants to gather your friends around around halloween time and you want to play a game that is almost like you're playing through a movie and it's almost like you just want to have a fun experience, not take things too seriously, that type of thing, then I think this is a game that you can pull out and enjoy. I'm going to give Betrayal at House on the Hill 2nd Edition a 7 out of 10.
So those are all my thoughts on Betrayal at House on the Hill 2nd Edition. With all that said, I want to know what are your thoughts about it. Let me know in the comments. I hope you all enjoyed this video, and I hope you enjoyed the second annual Halloween special. If you did, give it a big thumbs up. And if you want to know my thoughts on other games, or if you want more videos, make sure you subscribe to the channel for more tutorials, reviews, and unboxings. Thank you all as always so much for watching, and I will see you in the next video.